heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, well, some mixed signals in the labor market. We'll break down what hiring looks like within the tech sector and speak to the CEO of human resources platform, Athena. Plus, we get a peek inside the C-suite when it comes to the health of the tech industry and speak to the CEOs of CrowdStrike and Zscaler as those companies report earnings. And Amazon in talks to offer mobile phone services to its prime customers. We'll discuss well, what that means for the competition. All that and so much more coming up. Let's look at how tech is in charge the one of the day. We round out this week from the market's perspective, Ed, on the higher side. We're going to delve into the fact that really we've been led higher by some smaller key, well, a small number of big tech heavyweights that have really driven this rally so far this year. It's all about AI. It's all about one percentage point higher on the Nasdaq, even though we saw that blowout number for the jobs data, 339,000 jobs added. But Unemployment ticks higher. So do we see the Federal Reserve raising? Do we see it in June or do we see it in July? The 13 basis point, 14 basis point move in the two year clearly signals that the market is just trying to digest how much the Fed is going to have to fight what is still a very healthy labor market. We're looking at crypto just up about nine tenths of a percent. So that risk asset deployment is happening across equities and indeed Bitcoin on the day. But we're still languishing at about twenty seven thousand. Let's move it on and look at what's happened in terms of where we have come in tech stocks. What has powered us there and the relative strength index? I'm looking at the moment of what's happening in terms of big tech and AI just delivering. Of course, this was the week where we saw another $1 trillion company added to the club. It's still dialed back just slightly below that. But NVIDIA currently sitting at 170 in terms of where it's normalized from the beginning of the year. AI is the driving force. We see also a healthy performance in Meta. That's all about VR. We could talk that as we look ahead to WWDC. But really, the outperformance of certain tech stocks, it is just front and center ed. Yeah, there's a lot going on this Friday and a lot that I'm keeping my eye on. Apple's actually won. We're up by a half percentage points, $181 a share. I flagged that because if we get to 182 slightly above that, we're heading towards a fresh intraday record for Apple, which is astonishing when you consider actually from a relative strength basis, we're pretty much in overbought territory ahead of Apple WWDC. We're going to talk to Mark Gurman about that later in the program. Interesting if that momentum continues. In the earnings story, Broadcom up 1.8%. The company saying that AI sales will double, which is kind of overshadowing or sorry, outshining should I say, some slowdown in broader markets for Broadcom and Dell. Another earnings story up 4%. Basically, outperformance, topping estimates on a sales basis because of strength, particularly in the business sale of PCs. That big story in the market this Friday is Amazon, according to sources in talks with carriers to basically take wholesale rates and provide wireless services to prime members. This is the impact it's astonishing. Dish up 23% to the upside, biggest jump since 2011. To the downside, T-Mobile down 8%, biggest drop since March of 2020. Verizon down 4.5%. A lot of concern. We'll get into this later in the program with Bloomberg's Matt Day. Is there a story here about undercutting, underpricing mm. that legacy industry? And when I look at the market, Caro, yes, we had the jobs. Hot, hot, hot data. But there's no one catalyst, really. T-Mobile, for example big drag on the Nasdaq 100. What is it that the market's trading on this Friday when it comes to the technology sector? AI, another yeah. part of the story. Yeah, and boy, has it been the story for the entirety of basically May, but ultimately the entire year. And I don't know if you saw the story coming out of basically Bank of America once again showing us where the fund flows are going. And Michael Hartnett's been just putting out note after note, calling what he says is an AI baby bubble that we saw in the month of May. Yes. But did you see the statistics? In the last week of May, the money flowing in to technology a record amount, eight and a half billion dollars. That's EPFR global data. Extraordinary. Yeah. And we know why. We know it's the AI bubble. Well, look, there's this kind of FOMO element, right? But remember what we talked about with Joanne Feeney 24 hours ago. All of the gains in the S&P 500 year to date are just seven names. The mega caps and NVIDIA, which is a big part of that AI story. Then we think about the Fed. Hot, hot, hot jobs data. What does it mean? Looking at swaps, we're probably pricing for a hike mm. in July. Uh, however you want to phrase it for June, a skip, some in the market would say, higher rates impact present value of future cash flows for tech. So we've got to pay attention to the fundamentals as well. Ed, 
24 hours ago, you were talking to the CEO of Palantir. I know this is a weird week. So, Joanne Feeney was yeah. 48 hours. I don't know if you know, but oh, I have no sorry. idea what day it is, what time it is. But it was a great set of interviews that we've had this week. And, yeah, we were talking chips, we were talking AI. Let's talk payrolls right now because, well, today we're showing continued strength in the labor market. But we're just trying to dissect where that strength is and whether it's actually in the tech sector that we talk about day in, day out. Let's bring in someone who knows well, Roxanne Petraeus, CEO, of course, of the key company that is looking at the resource platform, thinking about the technology startups that you're focusing on, Zoom, Figma, even Netflix. Athena is supplying to these companies at the moment, Roxanne. Yeah. What are you seeing in terms of nervousness? Because you're actually all about compliance. You're all about culture, ultimately. Exactly. What does the tech sector feel like? I think that there's kind of this tension because there's obviously been huge challenges in the tech sector, massive layoffs that have kind of happened throughout the past 12 to 18 months. But on the flip side, there's also a huge desire to keep key talent, uh, keep culture and companies, whether they're navigating return to office, whether they're navigating sort of all the social challenges, intergenerational in the workforce. And so I think you're seeing both you know, the kind of ramifications of a, a bit of a tighter um, uh, economy in tech, you know, layoffs and things like that, but also absolutely wanting to hold on tight to all of your key talent because, you know, that's um, at the end of the day what makes really great tech companies is great uh, employees. So try and carve it out for us. 339,000 from a global, from a U.S. macro perspective looks very hot. But the unemployment rate is rising. We are seeing a fight for certain types of talent. The AI talent in yep. particular, we're just hearing how JP Morgan is just 40% of those that they're trying to hire at the moment have got yep. AI skill set. So is that what is being referenced by the companies you're talking to about this worry that those that they have decided to keep they're having a hard time keeping them? I think that's exactly right, that there's, um, you know, I think that there can be this feeling that you conduct a layoff and then it's just done. And mm. in fact, what I'm seeing with really thoughtful companies um, that we're really proud to serve is that their uh, people teams, their like management teams understand that you may conduct a layoff, but that's almost like day one. What you really then need to do is invest in making sure that those who are staying are happy, that they're connected to the company, that they understand new policies, uh, that they understand, you know, whatever uh, new things are happening in that company because uh, a company has done a layoff, but they are absolutely still planning for growth. They you know, still fundamentally believe in their core mission. And in order to do that, they have to keep the best talent. And of course, AI is absolutely driving a lot of this, but um, you, know, you need management, you need um, strong managers to step up. Uh, sometimes their span of control has increased. So I think that the idea that layoffs were conducted and then done, we're not really seeing that. Instead, we're seeing companies really invest in like, okay, what's the day after? What's the day after? What's the culture like in Ed? How much are you having to pay people? Because I think that's the other interesting right. part of this macro story on the jobs data today was maybe we saw that wage increase, in that wage inflation, just dial back a little bit. Yeah, uh, that third data point. Something I tweeted this week, Roxanne, was the story around Zip Recruiter cutting 20% of its staff. What does that tell you? Forget the economic data. What does that tell you when a company like Zip Recruiter that's doing recruitment is cutting 20% of its own staff about this market. Yeah, I mean, I think regardless of what company it is, you know, the, the layoffs, I think, have tended to be between 10 and 20 percent. And of course, any company that's uh, heavily in the talent space was hit early, hit hard. And but I don't think that it fundamentally changes. Like if you kind of pull back from the month to month and look year to year, everybody believes that tech is the future. Like there's still this really strong optimism driven by AI, by AI primarily. But across the board, I think that um, as companies go hybrid, key tools are going to be needed in order to connect management with um, with their employees. Like none of these, um, I guess, secular trends are rolling back. And so I think it's a little bit more, you know, what it probably <laughs> tells most people is that there may have been some overhiring, some exuberance, regardless of what the company yes. is. The past couple of years were quite wild um, in tech. And I think it's just more of a, um, like a restructure, not a fundamental disagreement that the um, future of these tech companies remains strong. When do we return? to hiring? I mean, I think that we are absolutely there. I still, many of the companies we work with, even companies that have conducted, you know, to, to your point, these 10, 20 percent layoffs on the exact same, you know, day may still be hiring for key roles. So I'm not sure if I had a crystal ball, um, you know, everything would be much easier for me hmm. when we're we going to return to the pace of hiring that we might have seen over the past two years. Yeah. But I wouldn't um, in any way say that the people teams that we're, um, we work really closely with 
um, have stopped hiring. They're backfilling certain roles. They're absolutely thinking about where they need to continue to invest. And so it's kind of this complicated dance of, on the one hand, perhaps conducting a layoff, but on the other hand, really investing in both the talent that remains and thinking about the talent coming in. Are those people teams being replaced by AI? <laughs> I mean, I think that they're being enhanced by, I, by AI right now. That's like sort of both the hope and I think what we're seeing in general. There's still so much of the people function that really is this like interpersonal dynamic. You're conducting one-on-ones. You're conducting really sensitive conversations. And I think there's an understanding even among folks who are incredibly optimistic about AI that you're still going to need to have these conversations, have this really um, complex interpersonal dynamic. But the absolute hope is replace a lot of that um, paperwork with AI so that you can focus more on the people work and not just kind of that um, routine, you know, day-to-day -day stuff. That's exactly what Athena is aiming to do. Roxanne Petraeus of Athena, thank you. Thank you. Now, coming up, CrowdStrike reports its first quarter results. We're going to break them all down with CEO. That's coming up next. I'm just going to take a quick look at shares of Broadcom as well. Interesting here, Caroline. Which story do you buy into when it comes to Broadcom? The narrative that AI sales will double over the course of this fiscal year or that every other business area is slowing down, particularly mm. when it comes to the memory side of the business. I think that's a really important stock to watch. Right now, investors liking it, up 1.9%. This is Bloomberg. CrowdStrike reporting its first quarter results earlier this week and boosting its revenue guidance for the full year. The company also announced it's working with AWS to develop new generative AI applications. Let's bring in CEO George Kurtz for more on this. There was some concern, George, about a deceleration in billings. At one point, the stock Thursday down 11 percent, biggest drop since November. Others on the street saying nothing to dislike in this earnings report. What was the most important point for you? Well, I think when you look at the earnings report, uh, you've got to start with we exceeded all guided metrics. <clears throat> In addition to that, we actually had record revenue, record gross profit, uh, record operating profit, and for the first time, uh, gap profitability. So when you put all that together, it was extremely strong. And the way we run our business is not by billings. Billings is more of a timing issue. You have to look at net new ARR. And if you look at the current environment with the, the, the current conditions and macro headwinds, we think it was an, an uh, absolutely strong quarter and it was a beat and raise. And uh, I think it's a testament to the product and the, and the customer base that we have. Let's talk about that net new annual recurring revenue. First year over year decline amid what is, of course, as you say, challenging macro environment. Is that macro environment improving in any way that the perspective you're seeing? Are, is it getting easier in the sales cycle or no? Well, it's certainly not getting easier. When we looked at it, it remained consistent uh, and consistently challenging. Was it something that we talked about the headwinds uh, for the last couple of quarters? Um, we didn't see it get better, but we saw it remain basically the same. So we'll see what happens for the upcoming quarters, and uh, obviously, everyone's hoping for some relief with uh, interest rates and some of the uh, debt ceiling issues. But uh, that remains to be seen. What? The clients that you're signing at the moment, what are they most focused on? I'm pretty sure everyone's thinking about generative AI, about some of the risks involved in cloud, which adoption is still strong there. What is the number one priority for the clients that you're currently serving? Well, it starts with stopping breaches, which is why I built the company. And we, I, I certainly believe we're the best at it, and I think our customers would say that. But when you put that aside, the number one driver really is consolidation. In the current environment, everyone is looking to save costs and consolidate. And with a platform that has 23 modules, we can create a very compelling ROI and a payback within the first year. What that means is we're taking share from other vendors, and we're consolidating it onto our platform. George, when we spoke at RSA in April, AI was the buzzword for everyone in your industry, both as a tool, but also recognizing that threat actors have access to the same technology. Now you've got a partnership with AWS. How did that come about? Well, AWS has been a great partner for many, many years. They're also a customer. And uh, when we looked at uh, you know, what we were doing, what they were doing with Bedrock, we thought it was a great partnership. We protect a lot of their customers and their clouds. Um, and when we think about AI, you talk about RSA, you know, we were both there. It was all about AI. 
guess what? CrowdStrike's been doing this since 2012, uh, you know, when I started the company. That was the bedrock and the foundation of why I started it. Now, AI has transformed over time. You've got generative AI, which we're excited to talk about Charlotte AI and what we're doing in that space. But AWS has certainly been a great partner for us and we look forward to advancing that uh, relationship. George, what I increasingly hear in the C-suite conversations I'm having here in Silicon Valley is technical expertise is the driver within a company. Who within your organization was pushing you to, to basically say, what can we do with Amazon? How can we build something within Bedrock? I want to know how day to day a company like CrowdStrike brings LLMs into their existing offering. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a great question, and uh, the good news is there's not a lot of pushing. It's actually built into the DNA of the company. That's the way we started it. That's the way we protect against these adversaries using AI. When we think about generative AI, we started this project uh, some time ago as LLMs were, were starting to mature and come to market. So we have a, uh, a group, or many groups actually, but we have a particular group in Europe. Uh, in fact, I was out in the office uh, when we launched Charlotte AI, our AI expertise and center of excellence. And we basically said, you know, how do we do this at scale? How do we partner with someone like uh, AWS? Uh, and how do we come up with the, the best outcomes for customers? And one of the things to keep in mind is you have to have the best data set to come out with the best outcomes. Always great to catch up with you, George. Thanks. I'm sure you're hitting the road soon again, but talking Europe and indeed the focus on AI, George Kurtz, we thank you, CrowdStrike CEO. Coming up, well, we've got plenty more to come when it comes to cybersecurity. Some, another key leader in this space, Zscaler, reporting its earnings, beating analyst estimates. More with the CEO next. And look, we've just got to keep an eye on other earnings that are out there, and Dell managed to surprise the market. We're up three and three quarters of a percent on the day. Why? Because actually businesses, well, they didn't fall as sharply in terms of their PC purchases as we anticipated. Look, the consumer, that is still a struggle, but overall managing to deliver what was overall, though still some concerns about the revenue outlook. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg. about Zscaler, just reported its third quarter results and beat expectations, even raising its full year forecast for adjusted earnings. Shares, as you'll see, had been performing well today, up 7.5% over the last couple of trading days. Pleased to say the CEO is with us, Jay Chowdhury, for more. And Jay, you'd pre-released, and many seeing that this is the solid numbers that they wanted to see. What are you feeling in terms of macroeconomic headwinds at the moment? What are you feeling and hearing from your clients? Well, macro conditions are tight. Uh, there's a lot of scrutiny, but CIOs are still looking for making sure they're doing what needs to be done for cybersecurity. But they want to do it by having good cost savings, by having good ROI. Since we deliver great cybersecurity and we can eliminate a lot of point products, the ROI is often strong, often about 200% to 300%. That's what's giving strength to our business. This is a good opportunity for us to work out what is going on inside cybersecurity right now. We just had George Kurtz on CrowdStrike. His stock falls 11% because growth is decelerating. Yours seems to be doing the opposite. You have a lot of government, a lot of enterprise customers. Why is it that you are benefiting from a spend on cyber right now? Look, markets do what they do. <laughs> I focus That's less. That's one way of putting it, yeah. I focus less on the stock price. I focus on building great solutions and taking care of our customers. But if I were to say what's helping us is two things. One, there are many aspects of cybersecurity. The aspect we deal with is implementing zero trust architecture, which is fundamental to stop ransomware and other uh, very sophisticated attacks. But number two, you may be doing a lot of great cybersecurity. If your business case for ROI and cost saving is not very strong, your deal gets put on hold. I'm going we to give Caroline the opportunity to ask you about artificial intelligence. <laughs> okay. But okay. ransomware still interests me. Yep. Where are the threats coming from right now? It's not been long since RSA and ransomware was a big topic of conversation at that summit. So, so where does ransomware come from? Yeah, well, geographically, yeah. state level. What yep. are you seeing? So there's a lot of state-level 
stuff going on. China and Russia are generally in the top two list. China, driven more by IP, and Russia, they do a whole lot of things, and probably many times it's driven by making money, though there are a whole range of groups that go after uh, ransomware for making money. Can I ask you, just your thought as an expert, a clear expert in the th field, about the, valid the credibility, the validity, when Russia and the Russian government accuses, well, allegations that the U.S. has hacked certain iPhones, particularly of those over in Russia, is that something that you think bears weight, that one could assume could have happened, even whether or not it did? There's a lot of reconnaissance activity happens, and all countries do it to a certain degree. It's hard to say for sure uh, which of these reports are true, but I can tell you that our security research team picks up a lot of reconnaissance because at the end of the day, there's communication going on. Before any major breaches happen, reconnaissance activity starts. We at Zscatter are like a switchboard. We are in the middle of all communications that happens between users and applications alike. And we often see a lot of that. That's how we are able to detect some of these early warnings of phishing attacks, ransomware, and the like. We have over 300 billion requests that go through our cloud every day. Mm. With such a large volume of data, you can pick up stuff. The example I'll give you is before 9-11, there was a fair amount of reconnaissance FBI had a lot of information, CIA and other bodies. If they could really correlate, there are lots of telltale signs. Since we have such a massive cloud, we have a lot of those telltale signs. And now AIML, especially generative AIML, is helping us to figure those things out at scale and help our customers. Generative AI, ML, always the key words right now in this earnings season. Zscaler CEO Jay Chowdhury. Thank you so much for your time. Now, coming up, Amazon shopping around for a partner in order to add wireless services to its list of perks for Prime. We're going to get more details on that from one of the reporters that broke the story. We're watching shares of Meta, formerly known as Facebook, as we head to break. Social media giant asking employees assigned to an office to come in three times a week beginning in September. That, according to sources, joining a clampdown on remote work in the tech industry and Caroline how often are we hearing this? Yeah. Three days a week, the tech sector come back to the office, having done reductions in workforce. Interesting one, isn't it? Yeah, it does feel like three is the magic number when it comes to technology. It's a little bit higher if you're looking across over on Wall Street and some of those big financial players wanting four or five days a week of yeah. face show. But notable that, well, even though they've got all their virtual reality ways of interacting online, they still want people to come in and interact in real life too. From San Francisco and New York, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Let's get a check in on these markets. So much going on from the eco to the news cycle. In particular, we're looking at an equity market that is charging towards a bull market, in part driven by relentless outperformance in big tech. Uh, similarly, also thinking, of course, about that hot, hot, hot jobs number that came in. Looking at swaps, the market's saying, OK, when we think about the Fed, then maybe a pause or a skip in June, call it what you will, and then a hike in July now seems possible. Throw into that some of the outperformance of single names as well in the marketplace, names to the upside like Dish, on that scoop we're going to get into in just a moment. To the downside, what we're seeing are carriers, T-Mobile in particular, down 7.7%, biggest drop since March of 2020. Bloomberg News reporting, according to sources, that Amazon is in talks with those carriers, mm. basically to buy wholesale rates right and start offering to prime customers some sort of wireless offering of its own. Let's continue the conversation yeah. on that exclusive Bloomberg reporting with Matt Day, who joins us now. Matt, what are the details of what you've reported here? What is it that Amazon's actually looking at doing? So it looks like Amazon's trying to add what would be the biggest perk to Prime in, in many years, maybe since they launched their streaming video service. Um, the details are, are sketchy, but what we know is they're hoping to add um, some sort of wireless service, maybe free, maybe as cheap as 10 bucks a month, and, uh, and offer that as a part of the Prime bundle to subscribers. And this is all about making Prime even more addictive. Because Is it because the growth rate's slowing? What do you think the real causation of this is? 
I think it's a little bit that. Um, it's also a little bit, you know, Amazon in this era is trying to cut costs, you know, kind of across the board and kind of re-emphasize the value of their core products. You know, that's online retail, that's Prime more broadly. Um, so it's not surprising to see them looking to, for a way to make a splash, um, you know, with it's really their main retail program and what they haven't in many, many years. I think the consideration here, Matt, as you know, you and I talk about this in the context of healthcare, in the context of transport. When Amazon moves into a new industry, that industry shivers. What is the logic in this kind of big negative reaction you see, for example, from T-Mobile, but also Verizon? I think the logic is that, you know, in the U.S., the market for wireless service is pretty well carved up between uh, three major players, you know, Verizon, T-Mobile, and AT&T. Prices are relatively steady. The thought is if Amazon comes in, you know, essentially rents one of those wireless networks, then offers to undercut the company they're, they're dealing with. And, you know, that means hypothetically less, uh, less revenue for the rest of the table. What's interesting, though, is one space Amazon hasn't really managed to make headwind is in is hardware, right? Mm -hmm. Is it ultimately going to give up the fact that, you know, you'll still be using an Apple phone or a Google Pixel, but you'll be using it via an Amazon carrying service? Yeah, that's certainly possible. And I also, you know, despite Amazon's, you know, high profile failure to catch fire with their own Fire Phone, excuse the pun, um, I wouldn't count them out as a, as a hardware maker, too. It's, it, there's always rumors coming out of Amazon that they might be kicking around the idea of bringing something like that back. But, yeah, it would be definitely a weird look to see somebody, you know, hooking up a, a pixel something to, uh, mm. to an Amazon wireless. Network. And let's just talk about hardware for a moment. Alexa or the data they're in of that particular hardware. Amazing story that also you're on. 30,000 Amazon workers had access to the Alexa data, we understand? That's right. Yeah. Between 2018 and 2019, uh, the US FTC says 30,000 people at Amazon could play your voice recordings, which seems like an awful lot. And maybe the more worrying part is the FTC alleges that half of those folks didn't need access to that for their job. Um, many of those people didn't even work on Alexa products. Um, so kind of a worrying uh, indication about Amazon's internal data controls on uh, really the most intimate stuff they have about us, which is our voice recordings. All right, our thanks to Blue Most Matt Day for that reporting out of Seattle. Papa Inc. is a popular elder care startup that's been pegged as a task rabbit for seniors, where contractors provide home assistance services. Think of it as like an Uber or a Lyft, a gig economy, but in the field of elder care. But recent findings from Bloomberg reveal a dark and troubling experience for some of its users. Joining me on set for more on her story from Bloomberg Business Week is Priya Anand. You gave some troubling examples of interaction between contractors that were employed essentially through this app and the elderly they were giving care to. But in the first instance, I'd never heard of Papa before. This is a company that's raised money at a high valuation. That's right. You might not have heard of Papa, but plenty of people on Medicare Advantage, Medicaid have heard of Papa. Employer plans are also offering this as a service for their employees who are caregivers for their elderly parents. And this company has been valued at $1.4 billion by investors, including Reddit co-founder Alexis Ohanian, SoftBank, Tiger Global. They've raised $240 million from investors. And they've racked up contracts with some of the largest insurers in the country, like Cigna, Humana, Aetna. You reported in that Business Week story some of the scale of Papa in terms of revenue, the number of hours of care it had given. Some of those facts, by the way, the company disputed, that That's right. didn't give us any up to date or, or, or other figures. That's right. Just explain in basics how Papa works, what the idea behind it was. It essentially brings the gig economy to elder care. The company says that they've created a whole new category of care by taking out some of the more nursing-related things that home health aides normally take care of in a home for an elderly person. So let's say you're an elderly person, you don't have any help at home. You need help running errands, going to the grocery store, maybe doing your laundry, folding clothes. The idea is you can call someone from Papa, they'll come maybe chat with you, help you feel less lonely if that's a concern of yours, and you get those hours for free from your health insurance plan in a lot of cases. Certainly in our particular age range at the moment, I'm fortunate enough to think more about the carers of my younger children than my elderly parents, but that fear is always within me. When I leave my child with someone who I haven't met before because I need an emergency backup care, now, the story, Priya, just heart-wrenching. Some of these, I mean, was it 1,200 confidential complaint reports logged by Papa over the past four years and dozens of allegations, one involving rape that you bring to bear, but there's sexual harassment, assault. And actually, it's not just 
the pals, the people, contractors coming in, sometimes it's the puppers, the elderly who are behaving badly too. Is this coming That's down right. to a lack of control? Is this coming down to lack of training? What is it from your reporting? The company disputed any characterizations that it is lax on safeguards and lax on safety measures, but our reporting shows that their background checks have had incidents fall through the cracks where someone who's had a prior conviction has actually been able to become an independent contractor through their service and visit an elderly person, leading to an incident. And they say they do background checks, but at the end of the day, the training provided is very little. So for home health aides, Medicare rules require 75 hours of training. But because Papa strips away the nursing aspect of that, there's no bathing, there's no toileting, you're not really supposed to touch the person when you go to their home, you're supposed to just provide help with household tasks and companionship. There aren't any training requirements. And so the company's training is essentially a short video that pals watch and then they're able to go to homes. And you highlight a lot of those previous workers who felt that there were issues with the business. And ultimately, though, nursing for the elderly is, has been woeful in many, in no matter what way it's served. We just think back to the understaffing of nursing homes during the pandemic. I mean, horrific some of the things that have happened. Do you think ultimately this is something that company is looking to tackle? Are the financiers, the money behind this, ensuring that this is a business that tackles these problems and can ultimately solve a really big problem for many families. The company says it takes safety very seriously and that safety-related complaints from both the elderly members who rely on Papa and its workers account for less than 1% of incidents. But we did find in our reporting reviewing, as you mentioned, more than 1,200 complaints, court records, that there have been instances when those measures have still things have fallen through the cracks. Incidents have occurred and things that have occurred in some cases on a repeat basis, harassment on both sides because the company has shared direct phone numbers. Um, we found a number of incidents where there were repeat occurrences and seemingly incidents that if someone had noticed a prior conviction may have been preventable. Of course, we have you have requested interviews from the CEO, Andrew Parker, and from the investors, and, and in large part, they've declined to comment thus far. But Priya and Anand, thank you very much indeed for bringing us what is uh, an extraordinary story on Business Week. Meanwhile, coming up, me. we'll turn to our daily segment, highlighting the state of venture capital, talking to the founding managing partner of Pear. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Early DoorDash backer Pair VC has closed a new $432 million fund for early stage investing. The firm's fourth fund will continue Pair's generalist strategy of investing across sectors including life sciences, healthcare, consumer, climate and artificial intelligence, of course. Ma Hershenson is Pair's founding managing partner and joins me now on set in San Francisco. $432 million early stage. Are you going to be writing a lot of checks or are checks getting bigger I think it's a combination of both. Uh, the checks have been getting bigger over the last five years. And we've also grown our investment team from two people two years ago, I mean, 10 years ago to now 12 people in our investment team. It's a broad range of target industries. Yes. I actually wonder how much of that is in the physical world versus software. Uh, most of it is software. Okay. Um, you know, we're very you know, focus on business at scale. And a lot of that, you know, has to do with software. Although we do have some, uh, you know, semiconductor beds, uh, you know, that are more in the physical world. Ma, what's fascinating about the companies you've chosen to back is the diversity of their leadership. A lot of female founders, diverse founders. Are there still a lot of companies being grown by diverse founders at the moment? Because we know that when Silicon Valley Bank pulled back, when ultimately the economy pulled back, it's been harder for diverse founders to raise funds. I think diverse founders are, you know, we have like 41% of our portfolio is female founders. Um, and they are amazing uh, entrepreneurs. I think they need a little bit, bit more of a nudge uh, to, move, uh, to move ahead with their fundraising. But they've been, you know, they are even within the downturn it's much easy, you know, it's much better right now than when I got started 30 years ago, almost, 
for diverse founders. So it's all relative, right? And there speaks the fact that you have founder experience, both you and yes. your co-founder. That was sort of your MO, the, the, dive, the way in which you stood out from the crowd. How are you nudging your own founders right now, particularly in the world of AI? How are you ensuring that your portfolio companies you already have are ensuring they're not going to get disrupted, that their lunch isn't going to be eaten? Yeah, you know, I, I think the message that for founders, no matter when, is always like focus on the metrics that matter, work really hard uh, to achieve those and forget the noise. It's the same in AI. Um, you know, um, we've you know, been in the Valley for, like I said, almost 30 years. So I saw the web one, uh, the web revolution mobile, and now AI. It's almost the same dynamics, right? Uh, initially, there's going to be a lot of noise and excitement, and eventually there's going to be some massive companies that will be created. Uh, so we are telling our founders to keep their eyes on the ball, you know, on those long-term wins, not on those short-term wins. It raises the question of how quickly you raise the funds. Mm -hmm. Was AI always your goal, or did you have to pivot, take advantage of LP interest? You see what I mean? Yeah, no, no, not at all. You know, I think we're a generalist fund. The same we do AI. It's just a, some part of what we do, right? There's a lot of life sciences, healthcare, et cetera. But I want to make a point that AI is truly a horizontal technology, meaning that it can be, it's going to be applied to all industries. It's almost like, you know, you couldn't be a company and not have a web presence or a mobile strategy, et cetera. Same with any industry that we're going into. So for our existing founders that are, you know, that perhaps started the company before ChatGPT, which yes. is when the population uh, became aware of AI. We're telling them, hey, there's new technology. You should be adopting this um, as we go. And same with LPs. I mean, our job is to be, you know, give the right advice to our current portfolios and be ahead of what's coming, right? So or, or temper expectations, yeah. right? There's, there is sort of an of LP course. impetus. I, I mean, you call yourselves generalists. Uh -huh. Think about life sciences, climate, and artificial intelligence. What about the inbound? Are you yeah. receiving many more pitches from AI than other areas? Absolutely. It has changed dramatically. I mean, you could say even 12 months ago or 18 months ago, the volume of inbound from crypto was really, really high. That's almost gone down to zero. And today, you know, the inbound from AI is very high. So it's climate, right, is what founders care about. Um, I do think, uh, you know, this AI, like I was mentioning, if you started any software company today as a founder, uh, you would probably be thinking about how do I incorporate AI into my company. So whether, you know, when, when you're at the application layer, we're going to keep seeing more and more of these AI companies. Not wishing to, for you to give away your secret sauce, Mar, but uh -huh. the founders you find, how are you searching that? I know you go to dorms, you've got sort of the, the way in which you get students on board, but where geographically are these founders? You come from Spain, you're the co-founder originally, uh, coming from Iran as well. How, how are you diversifying the kind of people that you're managing to find to build these companies? Yeah, um, we have various, I mean, I think uh, sourcing or finding the right founders in venture is uh, very intentional. So we have, uh, we're not sitting in a chair waiting for people to show up with these inbounds. You know, we're out there trying to find them. Uh, we run multiple programs. Uh, perhaps dorm of our most well-known programs are Pair Dorm, which is where we spend a lot of time in universities trying to um, find those great, high-potential founders that can go off and start companies. Forty percent of our portfolio will come from those founders, and this is a you know this is how Pair started. You know, it, it's not it was not immediately obvious ten years ago that you should be able you should actually build a firm and go and proactively source those kinds of founders. In the last couple of years, we've put together a program targeting female engineers. It's called Female Founder Circles. It's actually been extremely successful where, you know, we form community for female engineers that before they're out there starting their company, um, we've done four cohorts and within the first three cohorts out of 105 women, we've had um, nearly 60 companies come up with that have raised uh, significant seed right. so that's I, you know I, I do want your secret sauce I'm sorry I want you to give me <laughs> it right now so you invested in DoorDash early DoorDash was a success how did you identify them well you know I think uh, the DoorDash story is really interesting it's part of our how Pear works my um, my partner Pejman and I started Pear we're both very different yin and yang he had been an angel for many years I was an operator and we came together to actually uh, form Pear which is 
more than investment, we're helping to build companies. Peshman um, met Tony and reached out to me and said, Mar, I met this founder. He's amazing. We should back him. And I said, what does he do? Uh, he said, uh, food delivery. I said, oh, my gosh, not food delivery. That's a really complex, highly operational business. We're not going to do that. He said, no, 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 you have to meet him. So I actually spent a lot of time diligencing the company, walking up and down University Avenue and talking to every um, restaurant owner or manager right. and asking them why. And, uh, you know, a lot of what they said is, oh, my gosh, this changed my business. And Tony's amazing. And then Peshman and I um, spent a couple of hours with the whole founding team. And Tony was actually um, perhaps the only CEO that instead of slides, he just goes to a whiteboard and tells you why this is going to be a great company. And mm -hmm. um, he said it was not going to be a food delivery company. He was building the largest last mile delivery company. So even then... Uh, early on, he had a vision that yes. wasn't clear. Uh, that was super clear for him. Ma, great hearing some of the secret sauce and the way in which uh -huh. you did your due diligence. Thank you so much, Ma Hershenson of Pear VC. We thank you. Meanwhile, coming up, look, we're going to talk, of course, all things Apple. You're all going to be gearing up this weekend for what WWDC is going to have on deck on Monday. We've got the look ahead for you. Meanwhile, we're watching what's happening with Netflix. Shareholders actually voting to reject pay packages for the company's leadership. Netflix's board can disregard the results, as they have done in the past. Though the vote is significant, given the current strife between major Hollywood studios and screenwriters. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Time now for Talking Tech. First up, Russia accusing the United States intelligence of hacking thousands of iPhones, including devices belonging to Russian nationals and others linked to diplomatic missions and embassies in the country. Russia's main security service was scant on details and didn't identify which U.S. intelligence agency was actually behind the alleged attacks. Meanwhile, look, it's a bit of a revolving door again over at Twitter. The Twitter executive in charge of content moderation and policy has resigned. Ella Erlin uh, was one of Musk's most loyal employees and helped oversee Twitter's policies on harassment, on hate, on speech and, and, and violent content. Now, Erwin confirmed her departure in an email. Earlier this hour, in fact, Wall Street Journal were also reporting that Twitter's head of brand safety, as AJ Brown, also departing. Plus, Apple is working on plans to expand and revitalize its retail chain. The company is aiming to push deeper into China and other parts of Asia while overhauling established locations in the US and Europe. The iPhone maker aims to add about 50 new or rebuilt stores through 2027, including locations in Shanghai and in London. Ed. Uh, let's stick with Apple, Caro. The Bloomberg Mark Gurman preview of Apple WWDC is out on the Bloomberg website in terminal. Let's bring in Mark Gurman for more. Top of the list, the highlight of WWDC, the mixed reality headset. What are we expecting? Ed, Caroline, thank you for having me. That's right. So on Monday, June 5th, this is going to be Apple's biggest launch event in about a decade since they launched the Apple Watch and the first large screen iPhones. Uh, the entree, like you said, for Monday, a mixed reality headset, likely to be called the Reality Pro or the Apple XR Pro. This is going to be Apple's hot new product category. They think it's going to start off slow, but eventually become a hit with consumers and really be the future of the computer. It's going to blend augmented reality and virtual reality. It'll let you do everything you do today on an iPad or iPhone or a Mac in 3D. You'll control it all with your face, your eyes, and your hands. And it's really going to give Meta and some of the other headset makers like HTC a huge run for their money. Apple believes the category doesn't really exist today, and they're going to be creating the mixed reality category. Mm. Uh, right. And I tend to believe in this product. OK. And a lot of your story is dedicated to it. We've got 30 seconds, Mark. What else do you, do you mind about that's going to go on? Yeah, I'll give you the other highlights. One, Mac. Two, software. So the Mac, you'll see a new high-end Mac Studios, the new M2 Ultra chip. They've also been planning to unveil the new MacBook Air 15-inch there. Software side, big revamp to Watch OS, the Apple Watch software with widgets, iOS 17, iPad OS right. 17, and new Mac software. He did it. He always does. Mark Gurman from Bloomberg. And, you know, we're not going to end the conversation here, Mark. We're going to be jumping on Twitter spaces with Mark Gurman, myself and Ed. That's happening in half an hour's time, so tune in for that. But meanwhile, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We've got our podcast to catch up if you've missed it. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg.